Hi, this is Conrad Zimmerman of Fish Shark Marketing, here to remind you that this show exists thanks to the financial support of our listeners. For less than the price of a lower back tattoo, you can make your family question where they went wrong without pain and disfigurement. Just visit patreon.com slash fistshark or click that big Patreon button at fistshark.com. And thanks for listening. Downtown Julie Brown is downtown Julie down. She's gone. Oh, really? I thought she was going to go all the way. No, she got eliminated last night. And by eliminated, I mean she just sort of wilted. Kind of kind of like a flower or, or, or like, a, like a willow tree, how that kind of droops over a riverbank. She just kind of drooped like that in her seat, then fell. Oh... Yeah, yeah. I think her main issue is that she, although as addled from dehydration and starvation as everybody else in the house, um, she, unlike the others, did eat one of the spiders. Well, there you go. I mean, we told them not to eat the spiders. There's some that can't be helped. You know, you're gonna you're gonna eat a few spiders, but don't go out of your way to eat the spiders. Yeah, yeah. Like, like we tried to warn them that. Okay, some of the spiders are good to eat, but don't take that as a tacit approval of you eating this. Maybe that was the issue that I did say some of them were all right to eat before we let all the spiders in. Uh, I should have I should have led with some of them are poisonous. That that was probably on me. Still, it, it's been a really effective twist on the game in the season. I, I think this is working out on the whole. Like I hate to see. DJB go so quick because uh, I mean six weeks that I I really had her pegged for the full twelve. Well, she lasted the whole of season one, and I could not be more proud of her. But if you're gonna eat a spider that has been laced with poison, you're gonna die. Now, some could argue that I didn't need to take every third spider and wax it in an ingestible poison, but. Well, where's the fun in that? Yeah, that, that that can't be put on me. People demand drama in the fly house. That's what they want. They want to see celebrities. They want to see flies. They want to see what has made this one of the top-rated reality TV shows on cable television today. And and to see you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme carry her to the door like that? Well, I mean, that's the thing about Jukovic. He's a, he's a team player. And adding the team dynamic this time, I think, was was really uh, wise. Now, I mean, it's sort of they sort of fell into their own camps on their own, just out of a desperate you know, need to survival and a recognition that they yeah, probably yeah. were better off in groups. But uh, then taking that and making that part of the format seemed wise. Well, season one of Fly House was it was a little combative. Supplies were scarce. Flies were numerous. So it was very much a, a case of everyone looking out for themselves. Uh, not a lot of unity going on there. They splintered off into certain factions. Uh, you know, Julie and Lemmy, for example, got together with Millie and or Vanilli. Um, Matthew Lillard was in there for a while, but escaped. You know, fair play to him. We did say if anyone can escape from the house, they don't have to go back in. So he's good. Uh, but... Since we unveiled season two, Fly House 2, Spiders into House, uh, the human element of the show has really banded together while these flies and these spiders fight an all-out war amongst themselves. It's really forced them to sort of take stock, hasn't it? To to sort of see where everyone's skills are. Mm-hmm. Uh, because everyone there has has a talent. Like, they're all talented, lovely people. Yes, and consummate professionals, because as we noted last night, Julie was one of the few celebrities that had a GoPro strapped to her head. Now, after her death, let me pick that up, popped it on, now every celebrity has a GoPro on their head. So even though the show has been so thick with flies that we can barely see what's going on, the GoPro stuff does allow us to look through the flies 
and see the human drama. And the things we've seen have been tremendous. We've seen crying. We've seen people uh, eating the corpses of the war between the spiders and the flies. Uh, we've seen a couple of cheeky nibbles on Julie. I'm not sure who that was. Uh, hell, if someone even went back out into the uh, the garden and dug up all those sandwiches that someone had been hoarding there for winter. And those were those were still good. I mean, as good as they were when we put them in the house, they were, you know, full of flies. But that's what happens when you live in fly house. Things are going to get filled with flies, including humans. This, the, the, the spider room, the spider annex that we added on to the house for this season. Nobody's actually gone in there yet, right? No, 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 no. Plenty of crossover on the part of the spiders. They're playing. They're, they're actually involving themselves in the game. They've been leaving the tiny, adorable little portcullises that we've installed so the spiders can get out. They've been going out, forming hunting parties, laying webs, doing their spider thing. Uh, not carving down the fly population quite as efficiently as we'd hoped. Uh, it was our hope that we'd have... Um, I mean, we we did the numbers. We worked with an arachnologist on this. I think the fact he called himself an arachnologist was probably uh, a tip-off that he didn't know much about spiders and was more of a hobbyist. But, I mean, they worked out the mathematical number of spiders that we would need to get a lot of flies, but not too many flies. I still think there might be too many flies. Uh, and I do think that's because a lot of the flies in there, the older ones have kind of gotten organised. Uh, they've been there the longest. They've grown considerably large. Um, I'm seeing flies in there now about the size of a walnut. That is surprising. That is that is very surprising, yeah. It was unforeseen. Uh, I, I thought that flies didn't live for a year, but it turns out that the ones in Fly House can sometimes and get as big as walnuts. I didn't realize that flies would just continue to grow if they lived longer. You know, so it was the short lifespan that keeps them so small. Yeah, they're like orcs, basically. Most flies die out in nature. Uh, but apparently, if you put them in an environment designed for both celebrities and flies to thrive, uh, their lifespan increases. I mean, the fact that we've been providing free medical care to the flies has helped them, I think. Mm. Conversely, the lack of medical care to the celebrities might be another reason why Julie died. It did take her 12 hours after eating the spider, and we did just sort of watch. It's true. It's, it's not like we didn't know. No, it was compelling TV. That was the problem. Uh, I could have called an ambulance. You, you, they're there to, you're, we're there to do a job, right? We're there to make compelling entertainment, and that's what it was. It's not our role. To save lives. Our role is to document. That's a good cop-out. That's a good cop-out. I used that on the news this morning uh, when they asked us for a statement. I, I feel like that, that gets us a lot of leeway. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it gives us a lot of wiggle room. If the ratings were down, it would have been a different story. But a lot of people tuned in to see people die from spiders. I am a little bit concerned about the larger flies, though, then. Yeah, yeah. Did I mention they're as big as walnuts? You did. You did. It's about as big as a 23-year-old's testicle. That was what the lead lightning technician compared it to, anyway. My, my, my concern, then, is that it's not just going to be a matter of, you know, flies being able to enter noses and throats and, and ears and clog them up that way. And, you know, like, right, right. These flies, if they continue to, to really grow... Like, what's going to be, what are they going to be like in season four, right? Because I, I think it's clear we're going to keep this train going a long, long time. Like, I didn't realize the legs that, that Flyhouse had when we first ran it, but I can see no end in sight. Well, absolutely. The focus audience didn't seem to like it. I was shocked that, that it got picked up. But, uh, but hey, Ted Turner saw something in it, picked it up. And like I say, it is the number one cable reality tv show in the smaller bastard area you can't argue with the numbers right the numbers say it all it's it, it, it's it's an it's a tremendous success it's gonna run forever unlike the celebrities who can't run at all 
I mean, they, they can barely walk. They're, they're waist deep in flies and spiders now. Yeah, the bodies are piling up. Yeah, and some of those bodies are as big as walnuts. I thought that the spiders would be consuming the flies. Yeah, that's why we introduced them. Yeah, but they don't seem to be getting an opportunity because there are so many flies that even with the small bit of headway that the spiders have been making in terms of building webs and and so forth, it's 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 really, really slow going. And I'm kind of thinking we may need to come up with something else to up the ante in season three because I don't see the spiders winning this battle in the end. I mean, I say let's give it the season. Uh, the spiders have only been in there for 24 hours, but already I've started to see a couple of them working together on a single web, basically strengthening the silk intensity so that mm. more flies per capita can be caught. Uh, that's one of the early problems the spiders encountered was they were doing things like spider normal, uh, laying a web waiting. Uh, but so many flies, structural integrity of the web itself can't hold them all, just falls apart like cheap paper. Uh, several spiders working together on a single web. That might hold. They are still making that web. They started about seven hours ago. I'm starting to feel like they want to cover an entire corridor with it, like the spider gremlin in Gremlins 2, the coal on the new batch. It's it's a good strategy. I mean, it's a really just a matter of closing off territory and then you can expand out further, right? Yes, yes, yes. Um, given that the older flies have been in there long enough to pick up certain uh, knowledges, predominantly very, very basic chemistry, uh, obviously geography, they know the house inside out, they have a home field advantage against the spiders there. Uh, the spiders are picking things up quickly. I think naturally the spider is uh, more intelligent than the fly uh, in general, if we get a baseline spider and a baseline fly. But if we take one of these super flies, as we're calling them, we see that they are in intelligent more so than the average spider. However, the spider's adaptability is what's giving them an edge here. I think we may see bigger, smarter spiders by episode three. I swear I saw one doing a math problem. Okay, all right. Yeah, I didn't want to tell anyone that I saw it because the spider looked at me uh, and that freaked me out a bit. Uh, but I, I, I'm fairly certain I saw one doing some math. Like it, it was using mm. a very tiny spider sized pencil. Um, I, it could have been like a tiny splinter of charcoal or something. And it had a very tiny piece of spider paper, which I think was like like a corner of one of Lemmy's last LSD tabs. And it was doing, I, I think it said one plus one equals three. So they, they're not good at math yet. Right, right. But, but they're getting there. The moment that three becomes a two, I think the flies are in trouble. Hmm. My fear is that the spiders will get too good and then Fly House will just become Spider House, which we don't want. It's Fly House, spiders in the house. So I'm wondering if just as a preemptive measure, we might be better pumping in some more flies right now. Mm, mm, just to even the odds. Keep the uh, keep the spiders uh, a little overwhelmed. You don't you don't think that that's just going to end up making them, you know, work harder? I'm going to be perfectly honest with you, Conrad. While you were talking, I did just hit the pump in more flies button. Oh, oh, I mean, OK, OK. Yeah, yeah. Oh, shit. Sorry, I forgot it doesn't stop pumping in more flies until you hit it again. Oh, that's going to be a lot of flies then. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of flies per capita. I'm saying per capita a lot more in business discussions now. I think it makes me sound more intelligent. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I've hit the button again, Conrad. Oh, well, that's, you, you, you got to stop hitting the button. If you keep hitting the button, it's just going to be more flies. Right, so should I, should I not hit the button now? Well, no, no, you hit the button now because you've got to stop the flies. Okay, I'm getting very confused because you said to hit the button. Um, after you told me not to hit the button. Right, well, I'm telling you to hit the button now because you've got to stop the... Okay. So are the, are, are the flies going in? Yeah, yeah, you told me to hit the button again. Wait, so the, so the flies are still going in? When the button's lit up, the flies are going in. Okay, so the button's lit up now and the flies are going in. 
Yes, the buttons are up now, and flies are being pumped into Fly House. So you need to press the button so that the light is off and the bu- and the flies aren't going in. Otherwise, you're going to drown people in flies. That's a lot of flies. But the light's off. Okay. Well, that's isn't that doesn't that mean that the flies aren't going in? The flies aren't the flies aren't going in now. Okay. I hit the button to stop the flies. So, as so long as I don't hit the button again, there won't be any more flies going in. Well, that's good because I, I think I think at this point it's going to be impossible even just to breathe with the number of flies in there. Did you just hit the button again? No. So we got this this one here, and you can see it's got all the like the little spitty things and there's some like button mm-hmm. you press and click there is that satisfying is that scratching an itch uh i mean yeah it's pretty tactile it's got some spinny stuff it's got your clicks uh we got a little rotary dial type thing yeah yeah this this is satisfying i feel less anxious as i play with this yeah, this is as good as any other fidgety desk toy I've ever played with. Well, that's that's good because you know I, I we really do recognize that there's a, a tremendous opportunity in the market for these things, and I think if we can just come up with something that has a little little extra something for these fidget toys, uh, something a little different. As a piece of tactile stress relief equipment, that does good for my hands. Right, all the the little like knobs and the. The, the the clicky thing with the gear and and all of that. So that works. You're, that's satisfying. Yeah, yeah. My overall concern with this one is I don't think I could get it into a vagina. No? You don't think so? I, I don't think so. Um, the I... Hold on a second. <sighs> okay. Um, the idea of a fidget dildo is something I appreciate and i do think that's the secret source right there that's how we get ahead of all these other uh, fidget toys but this particular model is basically a dildo with a lot of knobs and buttons and dials branching off it like some sort of tray and so you don't you don't think that that could be you know like that could be a selling point you know, like this is this is not just a fidget relaxation anti-anxiety device also a, a very well-ribbed sexual toy. It, it's too ribbed, I think, is the problem. Uh. <clears throat> I think that's why the second model was better than the first one. Because the first one, I think it's it's presenting itself as a fidget toy first and a, dil- uh, and a dildo second, which right. I think is the wrong way to go about this. So you think we should, we, we should be focusing more on the dildo end? The way this first model is, it's a gimmick. It's, haha, it's a fidget toy, but it's also a bit like a cock. When really, we can do better than that, which is why I think the model number two, which is why I think the model number two is a much better way to go. Okay. Because that is offering something new. It's not just a fidget toy with a gimmick, it's a dildo with fidget functionality. It's double the stress relief. Okay, all right. So that's I, I agree. I think that uh, it, it, from what you've you, you've demonstrated to me just now, I mean, looking at it now, I could see, yeah, uh, that's not going to fit comfortably in a hole. I, I get it. And maybe maybe we could find some way to swap out all of the metal bits on the exterior for something a little like a, a vinyl. You could you could change the material to smooth the ingress, but I think no matter what you do, with the level of functionality they're wanting on that one and just the shape, I think it'll cause more stress than relieve it, if I'm being perfectly honest. That makes me more anxious thinking about it slung up me. Okay, all right. So then then the one that we, that we have here, the Mark II, mm-hmm. Now, that's designed entirely to be operated by internal muscles. The actual, yes, this, this is why I think that, uh, this is why I think that model number two is so innovative, because it's designed for penetration. You know, it, it is a, a, a traditional dildo shape, but if you look down the sides, we have, as you say, the ribbing here, which is actually a more pleasurable ribbing. 
These are uh, nodules, uh, dials that are flush with the shaft itself that your internal muscles can manipulate and massage and generally fiddle around with, keeping your hands free to do other things. Uh, you know, you can hold a marketing meeting, you can berate Craig, you can take some phone calls, you can tell Dean Cain we've got nothing for him this week, <laughs> and have a really, really relaxing time as you do it. I don't know. I mean, I, wouldn't that be too much of a distraction, do you think? Because I, the, the kind of focus that is required to manipulate uh, your internal muscles to fidget, so to speak, with the with this dildo, I, I, I get the sense it could be more of a distraction than a sort of casual kind of, you know, passive thing that you're doing. Well, um, hold on a second. If Let me just back up here. If I just uh, take mine out. <sighs> okay. Right. <sighs> Sorry, give me a second. Yeah, no, that that, that looks like it takes a lot out of you, so to speak. Yeah, 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 quite literally. And I didn't realize these were so large. It it's it's big and yet surprisingly comfortable. It is yielding hmm. and considerate. One of the best dildos I've had up me, really, and that's before we even get to the added functionality. Now, take that in your hands and run your fingers over that. And you just tell me even just how immediately satisfying that is just to touch. I mean, that is nice. Right? That is nice. And and let me tell you, when your rectum's fiddling with it, it feels even better. And I think so far I've conducted this whole meeting uh, without really letting on that I was even using it. But I have been uh, manipulating everything you're touching there. Um, my muscles have contracted around and manipulated and uh, flipped and switched uh, several times while we were just looking at model number one. Would you say it was subtle? I mean, obviously, whenever you've got something up your ass, uh, there are going to be a few tells, especially to those who have had things up their ass before. They know what the signs are. Um, but I think that there is a, a, a subtlety to it, to where you can go about, you're giving my dildo back, to where you can go about your business without giving away too much about what it is you're... That's Dollywood. Well, I I don't know. I just think maybe that's not practical for all applications, right? I don't know if 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 the internal fidget dildo is is necessarily going to be right for you know more more intimate settings, more more uh, you know like face to face meetings, things like that. I mean, sure, if you're telecommuting. Okay, I under I can understand that. I can understand that. Um, making eye contact while using it is a it's a little awkward. Yeah, for some, for some. Um, not for me. I enjoy it, but I, I understand that, that some people might be put off by that. I'm not sure that model number three is going to help them though. This one's a little more novelty. Yeah. Right. I mean, this is this is the this is going to be the hot thing. Now I don't even know what these toys are. So can you explain the minge spinner to me? Fist Shark Marketing is Jim Sterling and Conrad Zimmerman. Theme music by Ben Rama. Additional music by Alazar Chan. Our editor is Austin Yorski. Get more episodes and learn how to support the show at fistshark.com. Follow us on Twitter at fistshark for more of our exploits. Complaints can be forwarded via email to fistsharkmarketing at aol.com. And remember, if you can't create, appropriate. Goodbye.